Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to Nikkei Forum. Uh, my name is Sonoko Watanabe, uh, Deputy Publisher of Nikkei Asia. I'm today's year moderator. Uh, this is the second session of our forum, Untold Story of Chip War. Today's topic is uh, global competition for building domestic supply chain. So let me introduce our three panelists today. So uh, we have, please welcome Chris Miller, uh, the author of award-winning book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. Chris is from Boston. Hi, Chris. And uh, I'm also quite delighted uh, to have G. Dan Hutchison, uh, Vice Chair of the uh, Tech Insights Inc. Dan is an industry veteran, has been watching semiconductor industry more than 40 years. Uh, Dan is participating from Silicon Valley. Hi, Dan. And uh, our own Chen Tin Fan, Annie, uh, the chief tech correspondent of the Nikkei Asia and award-winning journalist for coverage of the semiconductor based in Taipei is also with us today. Hi, Annie. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a one-hour uh, webinar, uh, but in the middle of the session, we will take the uh, short break. Okay, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so the, uh, this series of the webinar, Untold the Story of the Chip War, has been discussing the big changes in the semiconductor industry, in particular since the publication of the Chris book, uh, Chip War. So uh, last session in July, uh, we discussed some changes, uh, including like uh, tightening up of the US export control and also the implementation of the Chip and the Service Act. But even after the July, uh, there have been many changes in the industry. So Chris, uh, from your point of view, uh, what is uh, most important or uh, important topics you are focusing on? And uh, for the invitation to join uh, this webinar series again, I think over the past couple of months, there have been uh, several uh, new news items that have been important uh, for the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, first has been the ongoing significance of demand for semiconductors for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. purposes, which has been a trend that is mm -hmm. underway for some time, but only continues uh, to grow in its significance. Uh, and so that's the first trend mm -hmm. that I would highlight. Second, I think uh, there's been a lot of developments, which I'm sure we'll discuss in the mm -hmm. smartphone space, uh, in particular uh, Huawei's uh, new phone, uh, and uh, simultaneously to its launch, uh, new sets of restrictions uh, on uh, sales of, of certain Apple products uh, in China, which depending on uh, the, the scale of these restrictions uh, could have uh, substantial impacts on the shape of the smartphone market in China, especially at the high end. And then mm -hmm. third, the announcement about uh, Huawei's new phone has sparked debate, especially in Washington, about whether uh, restrictions are too loose or too tight. And I think there's already been uh, substantial evidence of demand from some people in Washington to tighten restrictions uh, on companies like Huawei and SMIC even further. So those are the three trends that I've been tracking most closely in the semiconductor space. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Actually, the, this time we have already received like hundreds of the questions that from the uh, registered audience. And uh, now the point you differ is uh, quite related to their, their questions. So uh, we incorporate those questions in our discussions as many as possible. So now yeah, Chris mentioned uh, some three big terms, uh, AI and uh, Huawei new phone, and also might be the, some possibility of the tightening up of the US uh, regulation on the Huawei or China. But first probably the, uh, discuss about the Huawei smartphone because uh, this is uh, big news. And uh, although the Huawei uh, didn't disclose any spec about uh, their new the smart home, the product name is a Mate uh, 60 Pro and uh, it's semiconductor inside. Uh, but that the, that the company, the Tech Insights actually uh, did the uh, teardown analysis and uh, disclose it or reveal it. Uh, this phone used a new chip uh, developed and manufactured in China. The name is uh, Kirin 9000S and using the seven nanometer technology. 
So uh, also people are really interested in the, what is happening and the, what is uh, implication. So the first of all, down, yeah, maybe the audience and also ourselves want to know about this chip, how capable it is and how different it is from other like a seven nanometer chip produced by other companies like a TSMC or Samsung. Well, it's uh, it's very similar to the uh, seven nanometer non-EUV chip that TSMC introduced mm -hmm. uh, about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, um, you know, where the cutting edge today is, is about, you know, it's today. So it's about five years ahead of the, where this chip is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but do you mean that it is exactly the same? It's uh, so is the chip is the same, the capable of this function it is. Yeah, it's it's as capable as as the kind of uh, cell phone technology that the mm -hmm. application processors that we saw about five years ago coming into the market, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. so uh, um, it's a little. It's when we looked at it, it's it's kind of between the seven nanometer non EUV. And the uh, and a true EUV seven nanometer, and that's really because they've had a lot of time to do more engineering. The uh, mm -hmm. the DCTO uh, uh, design technology co optimization has improved quite a bit since then. Co general computer power uh, and applied to design is much better. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, from that perspective, it performs better than a chip that was a seven nanometer that was made five years ago. But it's probably pretty similar to a seven nanometer that's designed and made today. Yeah, some people the questioning about whether it is a hype. Hype means uh, only limited the volume of the production, or do you think the uh, Huawei, Huawei or high silicon or SMIC uh, can produce in the mass volume? How do you think about that? Well, of course, that's more of a speculation as mm -hmm. to whether it's hype or not hype, mm -hmm. and. The way I see it is, is uh, uh, that question really doesn't matter mm -hmm. because you can, you can, on the one hand, you can say, if Huawei is doing this, they, they, in order to make profits, they have to expect they're going to do it in volume. Mm -hmm. and, and they have to expect that the price of the wafers will be competitive and that they can get a profit from the wafer. So in that case, uh, and there's no reason why SMIC can't make the chip in volume because they, they, you know, people are assuming you have to have EUV, which is completely wrong. Uh, you 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 could do this chip quite well with deep UV, and um, uh, and they've got the same tools as everybody else has had. They have the same materials, so they're 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 really not restricted in there. So you either have to assume that SMIC is somehow suddenly incompetent, okay, and and but. You know, they might be. And so, you know, to the question of is it hype? Well, if it's hype, it still doesn't matter because if the, uh, uh, it, you know, we're not dealing with a a uh, open market country, we're dealing with a fairly closed market country where, they, you know, if the government's behind you subsidizing the chips, it doesn't matter whether you're profitable or not, and you can still produce in volume. Mm -hmm. And uh, um uh, and we've seen that, you know, historically, you know, way back in the uh, 70s, we've seen uh, stuff that would have been crazy by Western standards being made in China and Russia at the time. So, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, that's a, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a question that doesn't really matter. We're going to find out whether it does, because maybe if Huawei winds up backing out of the market, we'll know it truly was hype, but that's going to take time to tell. Okay. And now, yeah, that mentioned the uh, EUV and the uh, DUV. I think the most of the audience understand the words, but uh, uh, for a difference, like so, EUV is uh, extreme ultraviolet uh, lithography, and now the China doesn't have it uh, because of the U.S. regulation. So that means a SMIC or SMIC, the Shanghai company, that produce uh, this using the existing the DUV technology. So how about Chris? I wrote uh, some your know, contributing article uh, to the FT. So you like I describe it, it's a more the most Chinese chip yet, uh, or most Chinese smartphone yet about this uh, Huawei smartphone. Yeah, could you elaborate a bit? What does it mean? 
striking to see not only that uh, did SMIC produce the main application processor uh, for this smartphone, but almost all of the other chips uh, in the phone uh, were also uh, Chinese made and Chinese designed. The memory chips, uh, not so, but most mm -hmm. of the other uh, semiconductors were. And uh, to me, this was important for two reasons. One, because that's not the case for many Chinese made smartphones today. Uh, there's obviously variation between different types of smartphones, but generally there are lots of foreign made chips, Korean made, Taiwanese made, Japanese made chips in, in a typical Chinese branded smartphone uh, today. However, the desire to design out foreign components and replace them with domestically produced components has been a stated goal of the Chinese government for uh, a long time. And so in some ways, the Huawei phone was just as interesting because it uh, it, it achieved uh, or almost achieved this goal of having a domestically produced smartphone with the exception of some of the key uh, memory components. And I think this speaks to the fact that Chinese industry writ large has made uh, meaningful progress in uh, trying to reduce its reliance on foreign components. Now, as Dan alluded to, it still uses foreign machine tools in the production process, for example, um, but the components themselves in, in the new Huawei phone were uh, largely uh, made in China. Uh, and that's a success of sorts uh, for China's import substitution policy. Mm. Yeah, then uh, so the Tech Insight research also revealed uh, the increase of the usage of the like uh, local materials, uh, local components, as now uh, just uh, Chris uh, mentioned. So it is uh, the big improvement uh, from a point of view too. Yeah, well, one is, is uh, uh, these aren't machine tools. These are semiconductor production equipment. So they're deposition, they're lithography equipment. So, so, uh, um, uh, and most of those come, you know, they're dominantly coming from outside the U.S. I mean, outside mm -hmm. of China. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, you know, Applied Materials, LAM Research, Tokyo Electron, mm -hmm. uh, Nikon, mm -hmm. ASML. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the uh, things like the the chemicals, you know, some of the native gases, they can come out of out of China. But, you know, the, the, the critical chemicals are typically coming out of Japan, mm -hmm. Europe, and the United States. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, the the interesting thing though was it looked like when you looked at things like the uh, uh, the modem inside the the APU the applications processor that was designed by SMIC and the also the uh, uh, the AI part of the chip was designed the CPU was designed by SMIC so so a SMIC slash high silicon so it, it was a uh, um, it really was kind of a tour de force, especially, you know, especially when you consider that Apple's been trying to design its own modem, you know, and get around the Qualcomm patents and it wasn't able to. So uh, in this most recent phone. So it's really quite a tour de force in terms of the the IP that's in the chip itself, the intellectual property that's mm -hmm. to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, is this uh, yeah, some kind of the proof? Like China can design by themselves and manufacture uh, by themselves and using the more high percentage of the domestically procured, maybe the material, and without using the uh, EUV, but still produce a relatively high end, the chip and also the smartphone. The Chris, is this, uh, do you think, the correct understanding? Certainly evidence that China can design and uh, at the high end and manufacture at mm -hmm. the fairly high end. Mm -hmm. I don't know this is a complete surprise. It was already known that high silicon, which is Huawei's design arm, was quite talented. And before uh, export controls were imposed on it in 2020, uh, it was one of the world's leading uh, designers of application processors. So this is not uh, new news, but it's a reminder of the design capabilities of high silicon. And in terms of Manufacturing, I think, uh, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, this is continuing the trend at SMIC. Uh, SMIC has generally uh, lagged around four to five years behind TSMC for most of the last decade. Uh, and as, as Dan alluded to, uh, SMIC has now brought online a process that's a couple of years behind uh, TSMC again. So this is, uh, in, in, in many ways, a continuation of SMIC steady progress, but also the fact that it does keep lagging uh, behind TSMC. 
Yeah, one interesting point here is the question of the EDA tools, because supposedly, I mean, all the EDA companies that are really the dominant players are based in the United States, uh, Synopsis and Cadence and, uh, uh, well, Siemens, but Siemens Group is based up in Oregon. So uh, um, uh, the thought had been that by restricting EDA tools that they would be stopped pretty cold, and they were stopped pretty cold. So the real question here is, how did they get the EDA to pull this off? It was, you know, it wasn't a question of whether the the designers at High Silicon were capable. The real interesting question is, is where did the EDA cool tools come from? And uh, there's no way that we can tell by just looking at the chip or how that came. But there's something really. It looks like they may have made major progress in the case case of EDA, just like they did when they were locked out of having Android and they just designed their own Android within about 13, 14 months. Yeah, us now the Dan and the Chris pointed that yeah, there are several stages uh, of the manufacturing, the semiconductor, like uh, from design, uh, using the so EDA or at uh, the end like a uh, test, uh, the and the packaging. Uh, but uh, so in this stage, so Dan, do you think so the EDA, the maybe the China has uh, quite development uh, in this stage. So, but how about uh, the semiconductor manufacturing equipment? like our SMEE, uh, they are the company the, in Shanghai uh, try to develop. How do you see the level and the potential of the Chinese version of like uh, SML of the Nikon or other companies? Uh, they're still decades behind. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and there, there's just a lot of issues to overcome in terms of, of metrology tools, um, uh, the uh, the purity and defect free glass uh, um, that go into the optics uh, uh, there's just there's just a lot of learning that needs to be done there and so much of it is it's not patented it's kept super secret and and um, in these companies like like Carl Zeiss or at Nikon so uh, uh, it's a uh, uh, They've got a ways to go on the lithography. When it comes to deposition and edge, they've actually got some pretty competitive tools. How about Chris? Uh, if you see that those like are different stage of the semiconductor, the manufacturing supply chain. Uh, so now uh, you are talking about uh, maybe the design part. But uh, how about other stages? Do you see there's some potential of the recent development? How do you assess it? The data is that uh, as new restrictions have come into place over the past uh, 12 months or so, Chinese firms have actually been importing even more of the tools needed uh, to manufacture semiconductors. There's been an increase in the dollar value of spend on these imports, uh, which certainly suggests that Chinese chip makers uh, don't think they can get competitive tools domestically, nor do they expect they'll be able to get competitive tools uh, for some time. Um, but we've also seen uh, the Chinese government, and Chinese industry talk about devoting substantial quantities of investment uh, to domesticating uh, this type of equipment. I, I think Dan's certainly right that it will be a, a long and hard progress, but there's also, I think, more focus than ever. Uh, and there's been in China about trying to make progress in, in domestication because there is a concern that China can't access the tools today and probably won't be able to uh, for some time to come. Yeah, Ronnie, so you have been following the development of the Chinese semiconductor industry the four years. So do you see maybe the these products uh, Huawei, the smart phone or a chip inside uh, chip in 9,000? Is there some kind of the result of the like a Chinese ambition? How do you think about that? Yes, I think uh, just to answer uh, the question also before, I actually checked the numbers of China's imports of uh, chip equipment, foreign equipment. Uh, and then it's actually the biggest buyer of uh, all these chip equipment. It actually buy uh, more than 100 billion US dollars from uh, 2018 to 2022. Mm -hmm. So actually still rely heavily on uh, foreign uh, chip equipment uh, to manufacturing uh, also this Huawei chip. But I would still say it's viewed by 
a lot of people and industry executives as a really big milestone for China because if Huawei could successfully bring back 5G mobile chips in volume production and build 5G smartphones, then they are capable of bringing back many other chips and components for other electronic devices and equipment. And yesterday during their autumn product launch, they did not talk about chips for phones, mm -hmm. but they did bring up their chip for smart TVs called Honghu 900 and Kirin A2 chip for wireless earbuds. Uh, even though these may not need cutting edge chip production, but still show that they can increase their local content uh, by their local uh, manufacturer. Also, they talk about their AI servers recently and say they made the hardware as well. So I think uh, if we want to understand China's uh, semiconductor after development, Huawei's move, it's always very important to look mm -hmm. at since it's the country's biggest chip developer mm -hmm. and the biggest user mm -hmm. beyond uh, their collaboration with SMIC on high-end mobile seven nanometer chips. Mm -hmm. What we also know is Huawei has been aggressively getting into chip production and chip packaging itself for several mm -hmm. years after mm -hmm. being cut off access to uh, these foreign suppliers. We are also aware that it is working with different production partners secretly to expand capacities in many Chinese cities mm -hmm. in Wuhan, in Chengdu, in Qingdao, in uh, Shenzhen, in Quanzhou. So the U.S. crackdown really uh, pushed them to accelerate uh, building up a local supply chain. Mm -hmm. So now, so Ani mentioned about the other products uh, of the Huawei, uh, but also it's same the regarding the semiconductor we are discussing about this like a 5g the capable chips but also there are other kind of semiconductor like the chips for wi-fi or maybe uh power semiconductor for evs or uh like a gpu for the ai and uh, those now get a lot of interest or uh, maybe the chip for like a solar power generation so in those other area how like a competitive the chinese products is or maybe the potential uh, Chris, uh, do you think, how do you assess the current level of the Chinese semiconductor in other areas, like semicon for cars, semicon for Wi-Fi, or other areas? As Dan alluded to at the outset, the, the question is not only what's the overall level of competitiveness, but also to what extent uh, the Chinese government is willing to protect the domestic market. Mm -hmm. um, because if you've got a protected domestic market, then you don't need to be as competitive because you can sell to 20% of global GDP uh, simply at home. Uh, I, I think we should expect, we already are beginning to see uh, more efforts by uh, the Chinese government to provide that protection. And I think it's not a coincidence that the restrictions on Apple appear to have been ramped up just as Huawei was mm -hmm. announcing its, its new phone. I think those are two steps of the same process. When it comes to GPUs, which you mentioned, uh, as I'm sure many of the listeners know, the U.S. is restricting transfer of the most advanced GPUs to China. So there, China has a very strong incentive to bring uh, its own GPUs online, whether, the, whether it can produce GPUs that are as competitive uh, as the type of GPUs that NVIDIA is allowed to sell to China remains uh, to be seen. But I think uh, if I were a Chinese company, I would suspect that I'd uh, win uh, substantial market as well as substantial government support by uh, ramping up production of my own GPUs, even if they're only uh, almost as good as what you can uh, buy competitively. And for the rest of the types of products you mentioned, uh, I don't think there's any reason why we can't uh, assume that Chinese firms won't quickly be producing at volume at, at roughly the same levels of capabilities as uh, foreign firms. And in some cases, like autos, which you mentioned, you know, China is uh, just the past couple of years become the world's largest auto exporter. Uh, and we've seen uh, active discussion in the Chinese media about uh, policies designed to help Chinese auto firms domesticate their supply chain, which in includes domesticating many of the power semiconductors that are so important for uh, EVs. So uh, across this space, I think there's plenty of demand for more domestically produced semiconductors in China. And for many types of chips, Chinese firms are either just as good or good enough to win market share in the Chinese market. How about Dansan, uh, the level of the other area of the semiconductor uh, in China, like a GPU or maybe the semiconductor for the auto? Well, if we talk about, you know, the chips for, I mean, first of all, 
all these chips, if you look at a car, it's using everything from advanced logic to power and management ICs and even RF chips. I mean, a, a car today, people say it's a supercomputer super on wheels, but it's also a smartphone on wheels. And um, so, uh, but if we talk about the specific chips like power, the analog ICs that are essential for EVs, um, China's actually a leader in that particular technology. It's got some very strong capability with some of its own in, uh, in-country companies. And uh, uh, I know we track them and there's a lot more companies in the space and it's also not uh, easy to restrict in terms of semiconductor production equipment or EDA because it it doesn't need really advanced uh, uh, tools. In a lot of cases, they can be downscaled. You don't need the kind of high volume manufacturing that you need to uh, make logic chips. So it's been fairly easy for them to come and be very uh, to become leaders in that space and make their own chips. And the thing of it is, is it also gives them a foothold because the volumes, the more they make, the more they learn about making the advanced chips. So it does give them a foothold to continue to advance their leading edge as well. Yeah, thank you. So now we see the, some development, but also at the same time, when people see this situation, so question is uh, whether the US sanction or US like uh, regulation or limit is uh, enough or not. Uh, so other question is uh, whether the U.S. Uh, like export control worked or not worked, and if it doesn't work, uh, what we should we expect uh, their next move? So uh, how do you think, Chris? Complex question to answer whether it worked because it depends on what you think the mm -hmm. initial goal was. Um, I, I think within the industry, there are um, not many people who were completely surprised that uh, that SMIC was able to ramp a seven nanometer process, given that, as Dan said, uh, TSMC was able to do the same with uh, DUV tools uh, some time ago. And so, so that wasn't a, a huge surprise to industry, but I think it was a surprise to some people in Washington. And we've seen uh, multiple members of Congress, including some who are pretty influential uh, on this issue uh, call for tighter controls uh, because they were unhappy to see uh, uh, SMIC and Huawei uh, producing uh, new, fairly high-end smartphone mm -hmm. chips. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if as a result of this, uh, we end up with both tighter enforcement of some of the rules uh, governing uh, transfer of tools. And in addition, I think we should expect to see more conversation about broadening the controls to other spheres um, some of the chemicals and materials, for example, which are not currently uh, generally controlled, uh, mm -hmm. could well come under control uh, in the future. And it seems to me that Congress, in the U.S. at least, is is talking much more about that issue than it was previously. How about Dan? Uh, do you think the export control works or not? Um, I think they're working. You know, when, when these things were first brought in, one of the points was you, if you shut down China completely, if you sent them back to the dark ages, it might be it might start a war and it might start World War Three. So the objective was to find a way that you kept them a couple nodes behind, or, you know, about four years behind the uh, U.S. And what we saw with the controls that were put in place was they were really restrictive. Mm -hmm. They hit the China pretty hard, and they actually fell back about three to four generations. Two years ago, we predicted it would be about now that China would have a working uh, seven uh, nanometer uh, capability, and 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 so they've done it pretty much on schedule. And what's really happened is the gap has come back to that that two generation gap from a three to four. Uh, so you know, I'm not. I'm not, our company doesn't do policy or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, I'd be concerned if, if the regulations actually got stiffer at this point, because it might uh, push us closer to a really dangerous situation. Uh, you know, China's trying to bring up this. The other thing is, is what the sanctions have done is they've pushed China to develop more technology They've bought tons of uh, production equipment prior to the, uh, the the cutoffs. This year, right now, 
we had predicted that the semiconductor equipment market would be down close to 20%. It's only coming in around minus 5%. And the difference is the massive amount of equipment that China's been buying to get it in place before the uh, September sanctions from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, uh, that's been a, a big a big issue. And so what we're really doing is, is we're, we're causing them to become more competitive in the long run for a short-term gain. And I'm not sure that short-term gain is really worth it. That's my opinion. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Ani? So maybe the, the other question, the other way of the question, what is a sanction that China is most afraid of? Oh, Ani, you are mute. Hi, yes, I don't think China is particularly afraid of U.S. clamp down at this moment. Yes, the U.S. Uh, of course have the option to tighten export controls on companies like uh, SMIC and the other Huawei suppliers to further hit their progress. However, such measures would have broader impacts affecting not only China, but also the business of a lot of uh, US and other foreign companies and potentially slowing the economic recovery. Also, it's really difficult to ban them all. Huawei continue to partner with a big car makers inside China from Cherry Automobile to Bike to introduce new cars. It's very likely to have loopholes in any such of this enforcement. And second, China knows uh, it will take a lot of time for the U.S. to convince all the allies to be on the same page. Internally, U.S. also face debates from local companies, Intel, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, as they all need Chinese market to grow and to be profitable enough to invest in future R&D. And for example, Qualcomm 2022 still has 63% of revenue from uh, China and then many US companies from Apple to HP, although starting to move some production out of China, China but still have meaningful production that is inside China. And uh, don't forget that China already grow itself as a very important electronic manufacturing empire. Thus for mature chip, it's easy, they can find some alternative locally for driver ICs, touch IC sensors. They also have many local suppliers uh, for key components from displays, lens, casings, uh, print circuit boards uh, to batteries. So I, I would say that these export controls did slow down China's development, but they will not kill China. It's like people won't die if they cannot eat at Michelin star restaurants. In this case, eat those uh, most pr premium chips, but they can still eat uh, street foods, uh, which in this case, meet to low end chips to survive. Thank you, Ani. Yeah, it's a good way to the explaining. Okay, uh, we are now uh, almost in the middle of the discussion. So now uh, we will take our very short break, maybe the two minutes. And after the break, uh, we will continue uh, discuss this topic uh, so we will talk about uh, some Apple uh, versus Huawei. Uh, Chris just referred uh, at the beginning of the, his the word. Okay, so we will take the two minutes break. So please come back after the break. Thanks to you, our valued readers, Nikkei Asia has been able to invest further in delivering independent quality journalism from Asia to the world. From award-winning analysis on the US-China tech decoupling, human rights issues, and China's Belt and Road ambitions, to exclusive interviews with the people in power in Asia, and breaking news from all over the region, our team of over 1,500 journalists and an ever-growing dedicated newsroom will strive to uncover the stories that other publications miss. Nikkei Asia, the voice of the Asian century.
Uh, welcome back to the Nikkei Forum uh, Chip War discussion. Uh, so the we will continue about uh, this like recent development of the Chip War. Uh, so the next topic is about Apple. So uh, Chris just uh, mentioned a bit. Uh, there is uh, some development in China. Uh, there was some report Chinese government tightened their uh, ban on the use of the Apple iPhone uh, for the government employee the, from national level for the local level. Although the China Party Ministry denied uh, this report, uh, it's got a lot of attention. And also uh, Chinese government also criticized the uh, Western or US tech giant uh, for some possible, like uh, the, how can you say, the information control. So uh, Chris, how uh, do you see the, the situation? Some people might say uh, this is because the Apple, uh, we have the new products. So the uh, this is a more like encouragement of the Huawei, yeah, to uh, increase their sales because the Huawei lost a lot of market share during the uh, last late years, uh, and the Apple the share increase in China. How do you see the current situation? Probably is a relationship between the new Huawei launch and the ramping up of. Uh, restrictions on Apple. The restrictions on Apple aren't new. There have been different ways in which uh, employees of government uh, institutions or state-owned firms have been discouraged in the past from buying Apple products, but it does seem like there's been a meaningful increase uh, in uh, information about these restrictions over the past month. Uh, I think right now this is more of a threat from the Chinese government rather than a, a real effort to dramatically squeeze uh, Apple's market share in China. Um, but as uh, Huawei begins to ramp up production of this phone and, and we'll see how many units are produced, uh, it becomes more plausible for China to uh, try to replace some of the market share that Apple has won with uh, with Huawei's uh, new phone. And I think beyond that, it's a, a message to much of the rest of the uh, international tech ecosystem that they too are replaceable. Now, that's not always true in every case, but uh, China is trying to send a message that their market share may well be at stake. Uh, if uh, if tech restrictions be uh, if tech restrictions are increased uh, and if the tension overall uh, does uh, isn't tamped down on and so that's that's China's main ability to threaten foreign firms is by cutting off their access to the Chinese market or at least restricting it uh, and thereby uh, hitting with often their second largest market uh, in terms of sales. Mm -hmm. How about uh, what? So Ani, what do you see the, from the Apple's strategy's point of view? Uh, because uh, your team also wrote uh, some stories about like Apple's new development outside China, like uh, India or Thailand or Vietnam. So for Apple, of course, China is an important market and also the production base. But uh, the role of the China for Apple has been changing. How do you think? We have been follow a supply chain shift for years. After the U.S.-China tension, the first Apple product shift out of China was AirPods to Vietnam back in late 2019. We broke that story and then extend to several other products such as Apple Watch. More significant shift was iPads also being assembled in Vietnam by the second half of last year. And then the most a more uh, sophisticated one was MacBook's production shift that just started in Vietnam for the very first time this summer. So up to now, Apple finally has production bases for all of its products out of China, but it's just starting. You can see it took uh, Apple about four to five years to work with suppliers from 2018, evaluating, and then to really start to ship some production, some only recently, then to India. Apple produced small volume of iPhones in India since 2017 because of the massive market there, but really 95% of iPhones was made in China. However, the Zhengzhou lockdown, if you remember back in uh, 2022, October, the peak time when they met mass produce uh, iPhone 14 series really shocked Apple and the Apple suppliers because they found China could become quite unpredictable and very different from the past decade in terms of doing business, the environment seemed to change. 
And then Zhengzhou is nicknamed the iPhone city as it used to make 50 to 60% of our global iPhones. So actually what our supply chain checks tell us is that that incident pushed Apple to make up its mind to diversify meaningfully production of even iPhones outside China and tell suppliers they want now 25% of iPhones in India in coming years. And they want India and China to do simultaneously uh, mass production. So actually they want to relocate more engineering resources to India as well. Mm. But uh, does it mean that, so the question for the Chris, so Chinese government, the point of view, they really want to have the domestic, the strong, the companies. And probably this time the Apple might be affected, but also there are more. We have to, how do you think about that? That probably goes uh, well beyond smartphones alone. Uh, certainly, um, a Apple has market share that's potentially at risk, but in the PC space, there are, of course, uh, Chinese uh, PC brands that compete with Western brands. We've seen uh, plenty of instances in the past where Chinese government procurement, for example, and state owned company procurement favored uh, domestic brands. We've already spoken about mm -hmm. the automotive uh, space where there's mm -hmm. a, a tremendous growth mm -hmm. in. Chinese firms there. So across the electronics industry, the trend has been more replacement of foreign brands with domestic brands where possible, mm -hmm. and more replacement of foreign components with domestic components uh, where possible. And the, I think the only limiting factor here is just the ability of uh, Chinese firms to produce all of the components uh, at a high enough level and to manage brands at a sophisticated enough level. And there's been a lot of progress that's been made uh, over the past decade or so, but there are still uh, a number of key technologies that Chinese firms can't produce domestically. And I think it's probably still the case if you look at market share in third countries that uh, Chinese brands are still a bit less sophisticated than, uh, than foreign brands in terms of their uh, ability to win uh, market share in, in competitive countries. Thank you. Uh, so the question for Dan, or uh, Dan, so you have been seeing the industry quite a long time. So uh, including like uh, last uh, chip war, one of the last chip war between the Japan and the United States in like 80s uh, or early 90s. But as a time, so now it's uh, China and the US, but one difference probably between the Japan and China, Japanese market is quite small. Yeah, they don't have the big market like uh, China. But from your point of view, the, from the past experience, how do you see the current the chip war? Or, or what will happen? Or what this chip war will go? How do you predict? Yeah, well, uh, back then, um, Japan was the world's second largest economy, not China. So, uh, you know, you, you still had a kind of similar weight of mm -hmm. uh, capability. And besides China, no other country has spent so much and has had such an all-encompassing industrial policy for developing vertical leadership in semiconductors as Japan did in the 70s and 80s. And by the mid-80s, Japanese companies dominated the top 10 ranking of chip companies. Japan held almost half the world's semiconductor market going into the latter part of the 80s, and it developed this almost a complete vertical supply chain, and yet it lost it in its lost decade of the 90s. Uh, you know, Japan's uh, supply chain leaders today, though, they succeeded by going global. And I think that's kind of the interesting aspect of, you know, the success of the companies in our industry is they generally try to go global. And you see a single country's vertical supply chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The strength comes from selling to the best by being the best and from buying from the best. And, and so that means you really have to find... Uh, customers and suppliers from wherever they are in the world, uh, you've got to find the best ones. And so it's it, there's always a weakness to a, a nationalistic vertical supply chain strategy. Yeah, uh, now yeah, as Dan pointed out, the customer yeah, or OEMs uh, want to have the diversified uh, locations for the procurement. Yeah, this is true. But on the other hand, it is not only the like, China or maybe the South Korea or uh, there are a lot of countries now uh, try to build their own domestic supply chain in the area of the semiconductor, including the United States. Uh, so now it's a more like like a multination, like big race is going on. So 
Plus, yeah, we have those. Realize, the realize yeah. China had its own vertical supply chain in the in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And it failed because it wasn't competitive. Oh, okay. So now it's a second challenge. The, yeah. Or then, yeah. But also, how about the other countries? Also, we have the a lot of question from the U.S. audience. The future of the U.S. semiconductor industry, and uh, uh, so uh, now we know that there are new factories in U.S. supported by U.S. government like TSMC or Samsung. So, any yeah, could you update of the current situation? Yeah, they like uh, solved some kind of challenge, like a shortage of the skilled workers. Uh, what is the uh, current situation? It's such a hot topic here in Asia that why TSMC, which was so renowned to be efficient and can get chip plant to be up and running within 2.5 years in Taiwan, suffer a construction delay in Arizona. TSMC is normally quite credible about their uh, production schedule. They actually gave themselves some buffer when they talk about 2024 production during announcement of their Arizona plan in 2020. However, this July, they formally admitted that their mass production schedule will be postponed to 2025 uh, from late 2024. So I heard one of the key directors stationed there in the U.S., supervising this project suddenly look 10 years older in one year, then you can see TSMC actually has many culture shocks. For example, they don't have experience dealing with union back in Asia, and they don't expect the time to obtain all types of permits can take much longer. Also, they face a shortage of skillful technicians who know how to build who know how to uh, build clean rooms and install pipelines and uh, also the equipment since it is a very cutting edge plant. Meanwhile, the cost for labor there is about seven to eight times higher than in Taiwan. And the overall construction cost also increased a lot during a longer than expected working days and the inflation over there. So I think uh, it's still struggling. And also the CHIP Act, although it has dispatched this big money, 52 billion, and then a meaningful chunk would be for uh, chip manufacturing, but still they have a lot of preconditions. Uh, they they ask these chip makers cannot like expand uh, production using, you. U.S. money in China or country of concern in the next 10 years and still not yet really dispatch the money. So I think uh, all these uh, Asia chip makers struggle quite a bit. Yeah, Chris, uh, do you think the United States uh, could build a self-sufficient and also quite uh, cost-effective semiconductor supply chain? And uh, if they could, uh, how long it will take? That's a goal that the U.S. is pursuing, self-sufficiency. I think, as as Dan mentioned, uh, globalization has been a key strategy for most firms in the semiconductor supply chain, and most of them see it as core to their success. And so I, I don't think either in, in business or in uh, policymaking circles, self-sufficiency is, is really an aim. And I think if you look at the steps that U.S. firms have taken over the past couple of years, what you find is a series of uh, major foreign investments alongside major domestic investments. So Intel building a new facility in Germany, Global Foundries building new facilities in France and in Singapore, the list go, goes on. And so uh, self-sufficiency, I think, is not an accurate description of, of the goal. Um, there is certainly a goal of increasing uh, investment in chip manufacturing in, in the U.S. In some ways, that's obviously happening if you look at the data that's going into investment into uh, uh, fabs in the US. The question is going to be how economically viable are these facilities uh, and will there be further rounds of investment after the subsidies provided by the US government uh, wrap up? I think uh, the answer to those questions is too soon to tell. We'll have to wait and see uh, how the landscape uh, uh, changes over the next uh, couple of years. But at a high level, I think the, the government is already seeing uh, some of the increase in investment that it was hoping to see uh, by putting forth uh, these incentive funds. Mm. Yeah, now uh, Chris mentioned the country name like uh, Singapore or the Germany or uh, also mentioned about uh, Japan. So 
Uh, then, uh, so now yeah, Japan try to attract, or well, actually that there is some investment flow to Japan semiconductor industry, uh, including a TSMC and on Lapidus uh, in Kyushu or Hokkaido. And also Singapore is quite active, like uh, to attract the global foundry or other companies. So do you think, how do you see uh, the potential of those countries? Like uh, could Japan coming back again in the center stage of the semiconductor industry? in the near future. How do you think about that? Um, well, first, uh, Japan's chip makers are actually already strong in automotive. And it, after decades of kind of wandering in the wilderness, Renaissance emerged and became a leader, uh, mainly because it just stuck to business fundamentals and uh, and just, you know, worked really hard at it. And uh, and then second, in my opinion, Rapidus actually has the best shot in decades to bring Japan back into a true technology leadership role. Now, full disclosure here, I may be biased because uh, Higashi-san and Kyoki-san are good friends from many years back. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the symmetry that that both Renaissance and Rapidus names start with R. Uh, so maybe that, that'll give them success. But seriously, uh, what I know about Higashi-san and Kyoki-san is that they really understand how to be global more than most Japanese executives that have been out there. They've built organizations around the principle of being global and being the best at what they did. Uh, and then both had this sort of Ronin spirit that makes Silicon Valley startups so successful. So I think that's a big plus for them. Um, a lot of the Japanese companies that I've seen that were successful and went through the lost decades, they had that kind of spirit of independence. And uh, they brought IBM in, which is the first company to produce a working two nanometer transistor. Um, you know, so they're bringing in external uh, capabilities that really get jump start them. Uh, and then, you know, moreover, I think because Japan was so dominant in the 80s, they don't have a shortage of talent like the rest of the world faces, like we've seen in Taiwan, we've seen in the United States and in Europe. Um, you know, they, they actually have a, a pretty uh, strong talent pool to draw on that's experienced. Now, that said, though, the I have to say the walls they have to climb are higher than Osaka Castle. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what I can say to them is just gambate kudasai. How about uh, Chris? Actually, there are also more new players like uh, India or Vietnam. So the, there was a recent agreement between like uh, the India and Japan and also Vietnam and the United States and uh, both uh, to promote a semiconductor industry. But do you think uh, those countries, for example, that India will become like a center player of the uh, semiconductor industry? How do you think? And Vietnam have articulated a goal of attracting more semiconductor manufacturing to their countries. And they may succeed in attracting some volume, but they'll probably be more successful and are already having more success in uh, attracting more investment in the assembly and package segment and also in, in device assembly. Annie mentioned, for example, Apple moving some of its uh, phone uh, assembly uh, to India. I think that's just one example of, of many that we've uh, seen uh, in terms of news stories about uh, companies that are, are trying to move device assembly to Vietnam and to India. And if you have more device assembly in these countries, uh, uh, it, it, it does logically follow that you might well attract more uh, investment in assembly and packaging as well. And so my, my sense is that these com these countries are likely to become bigger players in the industry, but probably less so in fabrication uh, than in uh, the back end of a supply chain. And I think that's probably not a bad thing for these countries, because uh, as as we uh, look at the, the fabrication landscape right now, there's lots of investment coming online, especially in more uh, lacking edge mature technologies. And so I, I wouldn't want to be uh, a country in Southeast Asia building up uh, lagging edge fabrication at the same time as China is doing so and having to compete head on uh, with with China in, on price. There are any, so you listen to been to the Malaysia and uh, we have the also the questions from the audience in the Southeast Asia about the future of their country's semiconductor industry, including like uh, test and the packaging the, because so now Malaysia are quite strong. So from a from your point of view, how competitive those industries like Malaysia or other ASEAN nations. I went to Penang uh, recently. The region is actually a very beautiful place with ocean view and lots of greens. And just sit in the car driving out of the airports, you can easily spot many chip makers from Renaissance, 
Bosch, mm. WD, ADI, Osram, Infineon facilities are along the road and further into nearby uh, industrial parks on the Penang Island, you can see lots of expansions going on, big cranes, excavators, bulldozers, so busy work on the uh, construction site. For example, Intel is spending $7 billion to build two additional to packaging and assembly facilities. Uh, including one will be their most advanced and biggest 3D advanced packaging plant over there in Malaysia. And also uh, uh, drive like about 40 minutes to Kulim. In Finian, it's also uh, spending a lot of money uh, building what they call the world's biggest facility for silicon carbide chips. And in Finian told me actually they have more employees in Malaysia than in Germany. So it's already quite good ecosystem and it's booming. And, and I spoke with many local executives. They told me rising tides lift all the boats and they do find Malaysia benefit a lot from this supply chain diversification trend. And I find that Malaysia has one advantage because most of the employees I met there even is in the clean room. They can speak uh, fluent English and then even Mandarin. And then they told me that climate there, it's with, uh, with like limited uh, disaster, like no typhoons and no earthquakes. So that attract a lot of our new investors. And I think definitely they will have a lot of chance in this mm. new wave. Yeah, it is just some example of the like a diversification of the manufacturing location. Also, Dan pointed out like a single, like a vertical supply chain doesn't make sense. And also Chris said probably self-sufficient doesn't so much fit to the other uh, situation. Uh, but uh, yeah, we need to the wrap up the uh, this webinar soon. So. Uh, that maybe the last question is also a lot of interest from the audience. Uh, also, they still want to know uh, who will be the biggest winner or maybe the biggest loser from this the chip war. So maybe it started from yeah, Dan. How do you think? Um, well, I think the prize for it is for the leadership of the semiconductor industry, and you know the biggest winner is going to be TSMC, SMIC, Intel, or Samsung. Mm -hmm. Currently, it's TSMC. Uh, who it will be in the future really depends on the execution of them. You know, and it's it's a very interesting question because over the decades that I follow this, there's been so many leadership turnovers. There was IBM, AT and T, Fairchild, TI, and Motorola in the '60s, with Philips and Sony trailing as G G General Electric and RCA kind of fell away. Then in the uh, uh, then NEC Toshiba Tachi Matsusha in the 80s, then we got Intel and Samsung in the 2000s, uh, with you know TSMC really coming in as the foundry for a lot of the the fabulous companies, and then that enabled Apple to really rise. Apple today is the uh, third largest producer in the world in terms of the chips it makes for itself. So uh, uh, there's there's still a lot going on, and it's very diverse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's still going to be a world distributed world of superpowers. And, Who will uh, be the superpower? Maybe the after ten years. Yeah. Well, the uh, uh, I believe it's going to continue to be this distributed world, and I'm sure China's going to rise in importance uh, to its ability to work richer. But the uh, you know the leadership in semiconductors has always gone to those who work smarter and faster, not richer. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, how about the same question to Ani? Yeah, who will be the winner, loser, or um, next to superpower after 10 years or well, in 10 years? I think it's very difficult for me to predict who will be the winner. I think everyone have the chance. But when I'm looking forward, I think we will definitely see a more diversifying supply chain because I've heard from many uh, Taiwanese chip executives, including ASE, the world's biggest chip packaging and testing service provider, saying their customers want, want them to have a more diversifying production base. So now they are also expanding in uh, Malaysia. And I remember uh, recently an NSP uh, executive also traveled to Taiwan and he said their car making uh, customers really want them to build uh, their chips in different locations. So I think after COVID disruptions and after these US China geopolitical tension, people want to lower risk of any uh, supply chain shocks. 
And then we will definitely see us uh, Southeast Asia's role in chip and the tech supply chain will definitely grow because for uh, packaging assembly and testing, it's Malaysia and Vietnam, and maybe India, it's just starting. And the Vietnam and India also grow into very important, uh, will definitely grow into very important electronic assembly hub for a lot of big companies. And then for a uh, chip manufacturing, I think Singapore, Japan, and US got a renaissance. Definitely a China want to build everything locally, but will be more isolated. And then, so I think we will see a very diversified uh, point uh, supply chain looking forward. And I think uh, Southeast Asia uh, definitely will see their role growing. Okay. Uh, so the, maybe the last question to the Chris, the same question, who will be the winner or who will be the semiconductor superpower maybe in 10 years? To look at today's trend lines and try to project them forward, the, the challenge is that the history of the industry has been repeatedly disrupted by technological changes that were often pretty hard to predict. I think if you would have asked me 10 years ago in 2013, uh, which semiconductor company is most likely to be valued at a trillion dollars NVIDIA would not have been the company that I'd have predicted. Uh, and its ascent has been driven uh, by a, a new use case for its uh, primary technology, which in 2013 was almost, I think, impossible uh, to predict. Uh, and so that that speaks to the importance of, of technological change as well in determining uh, who is on top uh, of the industry. And uh, I think we, we, we don't know yet what, uh, what extraordinary new technologies will be uh, invented over the next 10 years and, and will have such a, a transformative effect on the industry. Thank you. Yeah, actually, there are more questions we want to ask, but uh, uh, we have to close the, our webinar. So the, thank you for the panelist for your comment. And now it's clear, like Huawei coming back, at least in China. And also it is quite difficult to see the single winner of the, the chip war. So uh, we are planning to have the third session of this uh, webinar in late uh, November. Uh, so uh, until then, uh, maybe please follow the news about the semiconductor industry uh, by Nick Asia. I think the uh, audience uh, started to receiving the Nick Asia newsletter. Uh, so please look at that. And uh, uh, please uh, answer the uh, survey after the webinar. Uh, it will help us to improve the quality of the next session. So uh, thank you again for the panelists and thank you again for the audience for participating in today's webinar. We are looking forward to meeting you again uh, in November. Thank you so much. So now it's end of the webinar.